Allergy. Allergic disease has a high prevalence, reaching at least 20% of the population in industrialized countries. In the last 20 years, there has been a trend of increasing prevalence in IgE-mediated diseases that are represented by asthma and rhinitis. It is a frequent disease and this is also expensive because of the direct and indirect costs linked to absence from work and school, prevalently because of respiratory allergies. Severe forms of allergic disease diseases are increasing and this leads to an increase in disease costs. What is, an, what is allergy? Well, uh, allergy is an immunological mediate, immunologically mediated hypersensitivity that can be divided into main mechanisms. Type 1 hypersensitivity that is linked to an IgE mediated hypersensitivity. Type 4 hypersensitivity that is cell mediated and it explains the delayed reaction after exposure to the antigen. When we speak about atopy, we speak about a genetically determined tendency to produce Ig antibodies against harmless antigens. These antigens are not pathologic like viruses or bacteria. They are antigens that, that the majority of people recognize as harmless. In a minor part of the population with genetic susceptibility, Ig against the antigens are produced and these people become allergic. The allergies are, are hypersensitivity disorders against normal antigens known as allergens. Allergens can be inhaled, oral, food or drugs. The epitope is the small part of the allergen that is recognized by the immune system. We can also call them antigenic determinants. So, hypersensitivity can be divided into allergic and non-allergic. We have an allergic, where we have an immunological mechanism defined or strongly suspected, which can be differentiated into IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated. The IgE-mediated can be non-atopic or atopic. The non-atopic is insect sting, ailments, drugs and odors. The, uh, the atopic can be an anaphylaxis, atopic dermatitis, rhinitis and asthma. The non-IgE mediated are, uh, can be mediated by T-cells, such as in contact dermatitis, celiac disease. Biosinophils, like in gastroenteropathy, can be IgG mediated, for example in allergic alveolitis and odors. And then we have non-allergic hypersensitivity, where an immunological mechanism is excluded. This classification clarifies that some of the diseases are IgE mediated allergies. In non-atopic, there is also involvement of Ig, but this type of hypersensitivity involves some agents that are not diffused in the environment as a food or inhaled antigen, so we cannot speak of atopic disease. Non-Ig mediated diseases are mainly caused by T cell mechanisms that cause contact dermatitis, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, and Ig mediated diseases like allergic alveolitis. Pathology in Ig mediated diseases. There is an antigen that is presented at the mucosal surface. It is elaborated and presented by APCs, like dendritic cells. It is presented to Th2 lymphocytes that produce interleukins that stimulate B cells to produce specific Ig. The main aspect of the allergic reaction is when the two specific Ig cross-link with an allergen to Ig are necessary. This complex binds to the high affinity receptor on the surface of the mast cells and cause mast cell degranulation, with the produ products of degranulation causing symptoms. The release of histamine from mast cells causes clinical, effect, clinical effects in specific organs, like rhinoconjunctivitis at the nose, eczema, if on the skin, anaphylaxis if there is a generalized release. We have then cell-mediated diseases. The prototype is allergic contact dermatitis. It consists of an allergic sensitization phase that lasts 10-14 days, and in this case an apten, an incomplete allergen, needs to be linked to a protein. The protein apten complex is presented to dendritic cells in the derma for contact dermatitis, and is driven into lymph nodes. T cells in the nodes recognize this complex and become memory T cells that will return to the derma, and in case of another contact, will generate an allergic reaction at that site. The second phase is called elicitation phase and lasts a few hours to 48 hours. It is a local reaction. 
So sensitization is a complex interplay of the individual exposed, inherited risk of becoming allergic, the timing of exposure, earlier in life the immune system is more susceptible to sensitization, but also to induction of tolerance, the dose, uh, high early life exposure may skew towards tolerance, the context of exposure, environmental exposure such as pollution, microbes, parasites, diet, lifestyle, and endogenous properties of the protein. Three factors may play a role in causing sensitization in the population. We have genetic predisposition. This is explained by the fact that some persons become allergic in early ages while others in all older ages. We have also an allergic properties of the allergen, for example, allergies contain, allergens contained in milk have full allergenic properties. And thus, it is an, an, an allergen in children, but once they develop an immune system, the hypersensitivity is lost. It means this allergen is weak. The dose also plays an effect. Some allergens become important because of the dose at which they are exposed. Drugs are an example. Drug allergies are rare during childhood, but become prevalent in adults and elderly, and this depends on exposure to high doses of allergens. How can we explain the increase in allergic disease in the last decades? The main hypothesis is the hygiene hypothesis. It says that reduced viral and bacterial infections induce allergy in genetically predisposed people. Hygiene means vaccination to be clean and using antibiotics. This causes reduced incidence of infection and the immune system is deviated towards the Th2 phenotype. There is also an environmental hypothesis, which could be complementary to the first hygiene hypothesis and says that environmental factors like food pollution and increasing exposure to some antigens are responsible for the disease. The main actors in allergic diseases, that is S cells and AGG, and the immunoglobulins, Allergen is presented by the antigen-presenting cells to the T-cells, which leads B-cells to produce specific IgEs. IgEs. The dendritic cell is the first to capture the allergen, permitting it to cross the epithelial barrier. Mast cells are equivalent to basophils, but are found in the tissues. They contain some granules that contain histamine and other mediators. The release of these mediators is the cause of anaphylaxis, which is a re generalized release of histamine in the entire organism. The granules also contain stored aparin and tryptase. The granulation also induces the novel production of other substances, the cotrions, prostaglandins, cytokines, and chemokines. So, allergy is a disease which is reproducible. Every time a patient is exposed to an allergen, an allergic reaction occurs. This depends on the presence of memory T cells. Immune system's equilibrium is maintained by T regulatory FOX P3 cells. If this equilibrium is lost, you have on one end autoimmune disease when Th1 is predominant, and allergy when there is a Th2 predominant deviation. T reg FOX P3 cells are the main actors in the regulation of this equilibrium, and they act by inhibiting the main effector cells in allergic diseases, so mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, and epithelial cells. Regular, regulatory cells are innate or they can be induced, for example, by specific immunotherapy. B cells obviously are the main actors because they are the source of, of Ig in collaboration with T cells. Ig is a class of antibody with two heavy chains and two light chains. Their main function is immunity to parasites. When you find increased Ig, you also have to exclude other diseases besides allergy essentially parasitic diseases. Eosinophils are the main cells you will find in allergic inflammation. They are multifunctional cells and in, allerg and in allergic diseases eosinophilia is mediated by IL-5. This explains why some, anti some anti-eosinophilic treatments for asthma act through this pathway. Eosinophils characterize inflammation and also remodeling because the long-lasting presence of eosinophils in tissues can create damage in asthma, this causes a remodeling of, airway, of airways. In alert, so we have the activation of eosinophils, which leads to granule proteins, DNA loss, so killing of pathogens and tissue damage. Cytokines and lipid mediators, 
lead to immune regulation and cytokines and matrix metalloproteins 9 to remodeling. In allergic and IgE-mediated diseases, there is an immediate response because of an immediate release of mediators. But you can also have a late response. So anaphylaxis can have a biphasic way of presentation. In the figure, the first response is linked to the immediate res release, but there is also a late response mediated by the release of mediators by basophils and eosinophils. In the US, the therapy given for treatment of anaphylaxis outside the hospital is epinephrine. There are two doses of epinephrine because there could be a biphasic anaphylaxis. Risk factors for allergy are genetic factors like HLE alleles, other polymorphisms, because the genetic susceptibility is needed to develop allergies. We have environmental factors which are also important, so all the factors involved in the gene hypothesis that could influence the response to infection, so antibiotics, vaccination, pollution, allergens found in a specific environmental region. We have defects in target organs like bronchus, gut, skin, which can also increase susceptibility to allergies. When a patient has not allergic dermatitis, like psoriasis, the skin barrier may be altered, inducing sensitization to allergens. Yeah, also triggers. A person who is already sensitized, some factors will be able to trigger the symptoms, such as viral infection, tobacco smoke, or polymers. So the risk factors are genetic factors, HLA alleles, environmental factors, defects in target organs, so bronchus, gut, skin, and triggers. So the first two, genetic factors and environmental factors, cause atopy. Then the latter two, that is, defects in target organs, bronchus, gut, skin, and triggers, contribute to transforming atopy into TH2-mediated allergic inflammation. Atopic diseases, in particular, asthma, atopic dermatitis, are associated to genetic predisposition. The risk of the disease increases in monozygotic twins compared to the zygotic twins. In this context, atopic dermatitis has a genetic background in more than 80% of cases. Regarding genetics, when a person has one parent that is allergic, the risk of allergy is increased. If both parents has an have an allergy, the risk is even greater. So, like you see in non-allergic patient, the risk in 10% parents the risk is 10% to develop allergy. If one parent is allergic, the risk is 20%, while if both parents are allergic, the risk is 30%. Regarding environmental factors, urban environment and westernized lifestyle are risk factors. This has also been proven by studies performed after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Before this event, there was high prevalence of allergy in Western Berlin, low prevalence in the East, which was a rural environment. After this event, the prevalence of allergic disease also increased in the East, and this is still occurring. This was a model to confirm the hygiene hypothesis and the role of the rural versus urban environment. How could we be exposed to allergens? We can have exposure by inhalation route outdoor and indoor, so pollen, house dust mites, molds, pets, exposure by ingestion, so foods, uh, additives and drugs, exposure by puncture, so drugs, immunotera venom, and exposure by contact, so topic drugs, cosmetics. Allergens are proteins or glycoproteins and are complete antigens. Differently from aptens, which cause contact dermatitis and often need, often need a protein to cause sensitization. They contain a B epitope and, T and a T epitope. When you speak of cross reactivity, it is because two allergens could have a common epitope causing cross reactivity. Cross reactivity can be divided into cross sensitization and cross allergy. Cross sensitization means that you will find some specific IgE that cross reacts with another antigen, but without clinical manifestations. Cross allergy means that specific cross reacting IgE are found and they do cause specific symptoms. So cross sensitization, no clinical manifestations. Cross allergy, specific symptoms. This is an important difference because sensitization means a positive skin prick test or positive Ig. Positivity. Ciao. Positivity does not mean that the person is allergic, but means uh, they are sensitized.
sensitization is a risk factor for allergy. You can speak of allergy only when you have symptoms against desensitization. We need to make a correlation with history because a lot of cross sensitizations are due uh, to the structure of the allergens. An example is uh, of cross sensitization that could become cross reactive with clinical manifestations is a person that is allergic to birch pollen, BET V1. BET V1 has a similarity with MALD1, which is the main epitope of apples. This explains why many people allergic to birch pollen develop symptoms also when eating apples. This is only due to the similarity of their two allergenic epitopes. A few years ago, there were only allergenic extracts that contained a lot of allergens, both allergens that would cause symptoms and some that would not. Now we can search if the person is sensitized to the major allergens, those that cause allergy in a large amount of people, for example, birch equal bet v1. Birch contains not only bet v1 but also bet v2. Bet v2 doesn't cause symptoms, so by means of recombinant allergens, they are produced to differentiate between major allergens and minor, which cause cause of symptoms, and minor minor allergens, only the molecule, but don't cause symptoms. We can improve the diagnostic profile of the patient. Sensitization to the major allergen causes creates symptoms while sensitization to minor, aller minor allergens is responsible for cross-sensitization without allergy. Aerial allergens are house dust mites, grass pollen, compos composite, ragweed, artemisia, urticaria, butulase, birch and alder, oleace, etc. Late and also latex, mold and latex, and pets, cats, dog, horses, Latex, even though a contact allergen, can result in sensitization via air. So those allergic to latex should also avoid its inhalation, not only gloves. The concept of panallergens is important to explain the presence of minor allergens. Panallergen, panallergens don't cause allergic symptoms, but are present in many vegetables. There are a family of related proteins involved in vital processes. So are widely distributed throughout nature. Plant panallergens are very conserved, so they are found in different kinds of fruits and vegetables and are responsible for many Ig cross sensitization and cross reactions between pollens and plant pollens. The main panallergen is profilin. The similarity can be seen in the 3D structure of profilin, profilin which is a common fold pattern found among allergens. This is important from a clinical point of view for latex because profilin is found in latex. Many people positive to skin prick test are not really allergic, but are sensitized to profilin found in latex. This causes allergy to latex, but in reality it is not a real allergy. Allergy, allergy to latex can only be ass assessed by measuring the specific Ig for FB8 found only in latex. If you measure the Ig for the whole latex extract, you'll find it positive because of the profilin, but the subject is not really allergic. This is the difference between our allergen sensitization. The main allergen in our area is grass pollen, and it causes symptoms in spring. Birch pollen, wheat pollen and dust mites are also relevant allergens. House dust mites are the cause of persistent allergy because they live throughout the year and especially when there is high humidity. They are microscopic and they live in warm and humid places so they give major symptoms during the winter and when we stay indoors most of the time. Pollen varies from the north to the south of Italy. Besides clinical history it is important to ask for the difference in symptoms with, while in different locations because some pollens are found more commonly in different areas. The main Ig mediated allergic diseases are anaphylaxis, which is a systemic immediate hypersensitivity reaction caused by Ig mediated immunologic release of mediators from mast cells uh, and basophils. Some years ago, the term anaphylactic shock was used. 
Strom has been substituted by anaphylaxis because you don't need to have decrease in blood pressure to have anaphylaxis. Indeed, anaphylaxis is a systemic reaction, meaning that at least two organs must be involved. If after eating a peanut a person develops vomiting, diarrhea and hives, the person has had anaphylaxis. This has changed the previous data because in the past a decrease in blood pressure was the main sign of anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can also be defined as a serious allergic reaction that is rapid in onset and may cause death. It is one of the major causes of death in young persons. There is multi-system involvement. The skin is involved almost always, but the iris, vascular system and GI tract can also be affected. Severe cases may result in complete obstruction of the airways with cardiovascular shock and death. This occurs mainly in immunopteral allergy. Sudden anaphylactic reaction refers to the same clinical presentation, but without a clear immune-mediated mechanism. We can hypothesize that some factors like contrast media cause the direct release of histamine. Tryptase is the main helper in making a lab diagnosis of anaphylaxis. If you perform trip test assessment within 8 hours of the reaction, trip test will be increased over 200 in 280. If it is high, you need to assess the, it again after at least one week from the end of reaction to exclude that the patient has a mast cell disorder. Whereas in isolated anaphylaxis, trip test increases and turns back to baseline value. In person who have mast cell disorders, mastocytosis, mast cell activation, Tryptase levels will remain high, so it is important to perform checks after 48 hours or better after one week to ensure that the levels are returning to basal values. Another mediator that has been linked to the severity of anaphylaxis is platelet, platelet activating factor. The more severe is the anaphylaxis, the higher is the factor. The problem with this mediator is that it cannot be assessed during the reaction, but it remains important from a treatment point of view because there are some antihistaminic therapies which are specific for platelet activating factor. The diagnosis of anaphylaxis is done by, in a first case, can be done by a respiratory compromise or reduced blood pressure. And this is enough. Otherwise, we can have two or more symptoms that occur rapidly after exposure to a likely allergen, so skin, mucosa, respiratory compromise, reduced blood pressure, J symptoms, or in third case, reduction of blood pressure is enough. There is an exposure to a known allergen for the patient and there is a sudden decrease in blood pressure. This is enough for a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. The main causes of anaphylaxis are food, like peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, fish, milk, egg, soybeans, peaches, season. Remember that milk and eggs are particular of childhood, whereas they are rare in adulthood. Venoms can be like bee stings, medications like beta-lactam beta antibiotics, such as penicillin, latex in particular during surgical procedures, Ig and the independent mechanisms could be involved like radiocontrast media, biological agents and in some cases Ig, IgGs, but it's not proven. In other cases there is direct mast cell activation induced by ag exercise or alcohol and in some cases the mechanism is not found but the symptoms are so suggestive that the patient is diagnosed with idiopathic anaphylaxis. When a patient as anaphylaxis with or without a reduction in blood pressure, the most important thing is the treatment with epinephrine. Persons who have had previous anaphylaxis to food or insect stings carry an out injector of epinephrine with them. In concomitants with epinephrine, steroids and antihistaminics need to be administered, administrated, but they are secondary for the treatment of anaphylaxis. Respiratory allergy. They are the most frequent allergic diseases in our population. We have allergic rhinitis, which is an inflammation of the nose due to exposure to viral allergens. It has a pre prevalence of 8 of 10-20% of the population. Definition is symptomatic Ig mediated inflammation of the nasal mucosa, induced by exposure to one or more allergens in a sensitized individual. It's a clinical definition. Symptoms correlate to desensitization. Clinically, we have nasal obstruction, sneezing, itchiness, and runny nose. Comorbidities are 
association with conjunctivitis, sinusitis and asthma. This context is called United Airway Diseases. Diagnosis can be skin prick test, total and specific Ig, or extract recombinant allergens. Inflammation occurs inside the nose and can go to the sinuses and lower airways causing asthma. So, we have a classification. can be intermittent if uh, less than 4 days per week or less than 4 weeks. Persistent if more than 4 days a week or more than four, and more than 4 weeks. Mild if all, all, the, all of the following criteria are uh, are present sleep preserved, no limitation of daily activities, normal working school activities, no troublesome symptoms. Moderate severe if one or more of the following symptoms is present sleep disturbance, limitations in daily activities, reduction in work and school activities, and severe symptoms. This classification is validated by the inflammatory profile that is assessed in nasal lavage. The inflammation of patient, patients with mild to moderate uh, to severe allergic rhinitis is analyzed, you will find that the more severe the inflammation, the more severe the symptoms. Very often, patients with allergic rhinitis also present with allergic conjunctivitis, which is defined by ocular itching, conjunctival hyperemia, lacrimation, and photophobia. Treatment algorithm. In mild forms of allergic rhinitis, the preferred therapy is antihistaminic, oral or intranasal. In moderate to severe forms of rhinoconjunctivitis, we will begin with antihistaminic therapy, but later intranasal corticosteroids are advised since they are more effective. The main therapy that can be proposed is specific immunotherapy. Allergic rhinitis can also be accompanied by symptoms uh, by inflammation of the sinuses, rhino, rhinosinusitis. So here you see, can be intermittent symptoms in mild to moderate severe, persistent symptoms in mild and moderate severe. The major reviews now suggest we consider rhinoconjunctivitis instead of sinusitis or rhinitis alone, because when the patient has rhinitis, very often you also have sinusitis and vice versa. So chronic rhinosinusitis is characterized by persistent and symptomatic inflammation of the nasal mucosa and paranasal, paranasal sinuses after 12 weeks, despite an inadequate medical treatment. It's a multifactorial disease with high prevalence, which reaches up to 15% in developed countries. Some are allergic and some are not. These are forms with nasal polyps and form there are forms with nasal polyps and forms without. There are big difference between this, these two pathologies. So you can have chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps versus chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps. So, in chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps, there is a polarization of T-alpha lymphocytes toward a Th1 phenotype, so I interferon gamma. Those suffering from chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, uh, there is a bias towards the Th2 phenotype with I, IL5. Inflammatory differences are uh, in the sinusitis without nasal polyps, Inflammation is predominantly neutrophilic, whereas in with nasal without nasal with nasal polyps, inflammation is predominantly eosinophilic. So no nasal polyps, neutrophilic. Nasal polyps, uh, eosinophilic. Clinical differences uh, with nasal polyps: we have more severe forms, frequently associated with asthma and acetylsalicylic acid hypersensitivity. Frequent relapse after surgery, 60%. The form without nasal polyps, you can have a possible association with an acute infection or and with allergy. In chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, we have the various etiogenetic, etiopathogenic hypothesis. Uh, the genetic hypothesis is the Th2 polarization. 
We can have an immune barrier hypothesis, which says that a defect in the coordinated mechanism, mechanical barrier or in the innate immune response of the sinonasal epithelium lead to increased susceptibility to microbial colonization. The fungal hypothesis states that there is excessive host response to alternary aspergillus fungi. The biofilm, according instead to the biofilm's hypothesis, we have a complex aggregation of microorganisms protected from the immune system, from the host immune system, and also able to resist to the antibiotic therapy, favored by defects of the immune barrier. That is, we have a TH2 inflammation, eosinophil survival and mast cell degranulation, polyclonal Ig alterations of acosanoid metabolism. In the form without nasal polyps, there is a predominance of TH1 phenotype. In nasal polyps, TH2 phenotype. This is why patients with rhinosinusitis with polyps often present with asthma and aspirin hypersensitivity. Biofilms are aggregate of microorganisms that are embedded in extracellular matrix and adhere to the surface of the mucosa. They are characterized by a le high levels of antibiotic resistance. This form of rhinosinusitis does not respond well to antibiotic treatment. There is also an autoimmune hypothesis because some works demonstrate local anti-DNA antibodies but this is only one paper and needs to be confirmed. Finally, there are some defects in arachidonic acid metabolism and this explains why these forms are associated with aspirin hypersensitivity. Therefore, it's a multifactorial disease. Chronic rhinosinusitis, Th1 diseases per in particular develops without polyps, while Th2 forms polyps. Uh, we have then severe chronic upper airway disease. Definition is uncontrolled rhinitis despite maximal pharmacotherapy. This includes allergic rhinitis, non allergic rhinitis, rhinitis with uh, aspirin uh, hypersensitivity, chronic rhinosinusitis with or without polyps, occupational rhinitis. Occupational rhinitis refers to rhinitis due to an allergen encountered in the workplace. An example would be rhinitis to latex in a doctor. The upper and lower areas are linked anatomically, so it's very important to consider this aspect even for treating the patient because rhinitis is the most known risk factor for asthma. 70-80% of asthmatics also have rhinitis. In the majority of cases, rhinitis onset precedes asthma onset, so it's a disease to deal with even when it's not so severe. The two diseases are due to the same inflammatory process. So regardless of whether in the nose or bronchi there will be eosinophilic inflammation. The treatment of the upper iris can also block the progression of rhinitis to asthma. The optimal therapy is a combination strategy. Allergen-specific immunotherapy could prevent the progression from rhinitis to asthma. This can be demonstrated by challenging the patient with an allergen. A patient allergic to dust mites can be exposed to dust and in the bronchi, an eosinophilic inflammation occurs. This confirms the link between the upper and lower airways. When a patient has persistent rhinitis, he should be investigated for concomitant asthma. Cough could be an equivalent of asthma, so the patient needs to be examined and if history is suggestive for persistent rhinitis, with few possible bronchial symptoms like isolated cough, he has to be investigated with spirometry which could demonstrate an, an, an obstruction or not, or not. In the case of obstruction, a reversible test with beta-2 agonist must be performed to differentiate asthma from COPD. Asthma will have re reversib reversibility, while in COPD it will not occur. Asthma is a disease which changes in hours and days, so if spirometry is performed during a moment in which the patient is asymptomatic, Bronchoprovocative metacoline challenges performed with reduction in FEV1 only in asthmatics. So, clinical history and clinical examination, if positive or suggested, we do spirometry. If there is an obstruction, we do a reversibility test with beta 2 agonist. Asthma re will be reversible, COPD not. If it's normal, we can do a bronchoprovocation test with metacoline with re reduction in FEV1 only in asthmatics. Asthma. 
It's defined as an heterogeneous disease usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation. Respiratory symptoms are wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. They vary over, over time and intensity, and the patient may only have wheezing or and cough. It's heterogeneous because it depends on, the, on an interaction between genetics, environment, and disease variability. It should be taken into account for treatment because asthma could be treated in many ways considering these phenotypes. We have clinical phenotypes, severity, severe asthma is a type of asthma. There is also treatment resistance. Defining allergic and or non-allergic asthma, some patients have asthma or, and there, is an, there will be an association with sensitization to an antigen, while in other forms of asthma, like intrinsic asthma, an allergenic aspect can be found even if the inflammation is the same. Studying inflammation. There are cases of asthma with prevalent eosinophilic inflammation, cases with more neutrophilic inflammation, and other case, cases with few cells in the inflammatory exudate, which characterizes asthma. It can have an increased duration of asthma. In general, we say that neutrophilic asthma is more frequent in patients who have had asthma for a long time, and so inflammation has changed. The beginning inflammation is more frequently eosinophilic, and the more remodeling happens, the more the inflammation becomes neutrophilic. Smokers, asthmatic smokers, have more neutrophils in induced sputum compared to non-smokers. Pollution also correlates with an increased neutrophilic inflammation. Neutrophilic inflammation is also a reason for poor response to corticosteroids. Diagnosis is based on history and on spirometry on the reversibility test or on the finding of bronchial hyperresponsiveness. The reversibility test is, is positive when spirometry demonstrates an increase of 12% and increase of 1200 mL of, of FF1 after inhalation of salbutamol. If reversibility is absent, the patient should perform bronchial provocation test with mectacolin to see if there is hyperresponsiveness. Hyperresponsiveness is defined as the decrease in FF1 of more than 20% with a dose of metacoline less than 1000 mg. Prevention. To prevent asthma, the current recommendation is to avoid exposure to tobacco in pregnancy and early life, encourage vaginal delivery, advise breastfeeding for general health benefits, and avoid acetaminophen and antibiotics in the first years of age. Secondary prevention includes assessment of risk factors like allergy. If the patient is allergic to house dust mites, the first step is to reduce mites in the house by using the humidifiers and or, or other methods. It is also important to manage comorbidities like rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, GERD hypersensitivity to aspirin and NSAIDs. Therapy. The two major categories of therapy are Long-term control therapies, which are the more impor most important therapies, must be taken every day. They are used to reduce inflammation, relax airway muscles, and improve symptoms and airway function. These drugs are inhaled corticosteroids, which are the main therapy, and this, if this is not enough, long-acting beta-2 agonists and leuco leukotriene modulators are added. For the quick relief of symptoms, of acute symptoms, short-acting beta-2 agonists are used, like salbutamol. For an allergist, the most important way to modify the natural history of the allergy is to use allergen-specific immunotherapy. It's indicated in patients with IgE-mediated allergic rhinitis, well-controlled asthma, and immunoptera allergy. Immunotherapy can be given by subcutaneous or sublingual routes. It has to be performed for 3-5 years with different schedules considering the specific allergen. It has been used for more than 50 years and the ex extract has been improved a lot. This therapy is, are effective against allergies to pollens, cats, alter alternaria, house dust mites, and immuno immunoptera. For food and other drug allergies, allergic immunotherapy is not used, is not used in the routine setting. What is the mechanism of specific immunotherapy? It reduces the tissue amounts of mediator release. It reduces allergy specific proliferation, reduces the amount of late phase reaction, and it reduces the action of T cells and acts on the regulatory FOXP3 T cells by increasing their production of IL 10. This leads to an increase in IgG4 that links IgA and avoids the cross linking on the surface of mast cells. You then have Imenoptera venom allergy. 
allergy to this venom can lead to severe symptoms. If the patient is exposed to many stings, the reaction could be toxic. In sensitized individuals, one sting may be enough for a strong reaction. It is an Ig mediated response and the severity of reaction is greatest in B allergies. Reactions can go from simple urticaria to anaphylaxis. The unique treatment in these patients is specific immunotherapy. In this case, only subcutaneous therapy is available. It's indicated in patients who, have, who had a severe previous reaction and in patients who had a moderate reaction, but are professionally exposed, such as beekeepers. Diagnosis of Ig mediated diseases. These are first-level tests which are performed for out-clinic patients. Skin prick tests with, an aller with allergen extract are performed for allergens and food allergens. Intradermal tests are performed for some drug allergies and for immunoptera allergies. They are simple, cheap and give rapid information. They are used in the routine setting. Second level tests of, for Ig diseases are total Ig assessment and specific Ig assessment, available for natural extracts of allergens like grass pollen, recombinant allergens. For example, for grass pollen, we have PHL15, which are assessed to understand if desensitization corresponds to re real allergy, or um, or to a sensitization to a pan allergen that is not clinically relevant. The component uh, resolved diagnosis is defined by the assessment of IgG to recombinant molecules and not only to the main extract. It's very important because it allows us to demonstrate a clinically significant allergy. For example, there is anaphylaxis which happens in persons with X only if associated with exercise. The component resolved diagnosis permits the assessment of a specific molecule and the diagnosis of a disease that otherwise could be not diagnosable. When a specific part of, of an allergen is responsible for a clinical entity, component resolved diagnosis is essential. Example, in insect venom anaphylaxis, V5 is associated with a more severe form of allergy to immunoptera. When the specific Ig for V5 is assessed and is positive, you can say to the patient that there are, they are at risk of anaphylaxis. At this point, allergen immunotherapy may be proposed because you know that this patient is at risk for anaphylaxis. There are some molecules that are associated to a specific clinical entity, and when you are able to assess them, you can make a more precise diagnosis. Another example is CCD, which is carbohydrate components. When you perform at the test for immunoptera in blood, you assess specific Ig for different immunoptera, and sometimes you find that all are positive and you can perform immunotherapy for all of them. Therefore, you assess the specific Ig for some molecules that you know are the major allergens of the insect and you measure sensitization to these carbohydrate components which is found in all immunoptera. This is positive, it explains the multiple positivity creating false positives. Combining the major allergens and the minor allergens of a determinant, determinant allergen can help make a better decision for treating the patient. The third level of diagnosis consists in this challenge. Nasal and bronchial specific provocation tests are performed only in research settings or in the field of occupational diseases. It consists in exposing patients to the suspected antigen in a chamber and to observe antigens uh, changes in inflammation and the respiratory function. It permits the diagnosis of occupational asthma. The fields of food, uh, it's considered a gold standard to make a diagnosis of food allergy. There are many false positives to the allergy test if only extracts are used. To make a real diagnosis of food allergy, a food challenge must be done. However, a food challenge is not always feasible because of the adverse reactions associated to allergy. It can be done in real life practice when the suspicion of allergy obtained from medical history is weak. This allows the patient to reintroduce the food into his diet. The drug provocation tests are performed to diagnose drug allergy when the suspicion is weak, as per food provocation test. In this case, we don't use this test to induce a reaction, but to choose an alternative drug in case the patient needs it. If a patient has an allergy to NSAIDs, we, he could have a reaction to several drugs. 
In this patient, other drugs could be given that don't generate a reaction.